I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, okay. Yeah, thank you. All right. So we're about to start now. My name is um Nos Ajewumbo Christabel Chigeber. And I'll be taking you on today's session and uh, tonight's session. So if you have any questions, you could just write down your questions and then at the end of the presentation, you can just ask your questions and I'll give you answers to your question and clarify any misconceptions or doubts that you may have. So please can we pray? Our Heavenly Father and our God, we ask, O oh Lord, that you come and dwell in our presence this morning, come and dwell in our midst this morning. Father, give us wisdom, give us understanding, give us retentive memory that at the end of the day, we will have the knowledge that we need to take care of our babies and that we will have any misconceptions and doubts clear from our mind. Thank you, King of Glory, thank you, Ancient of Grace. For having answered our prayers from Jesus in your faith. So, for those of you just joining us, in case you didn't join the moment, I said my name is Nurse Christabel Ajeru Wachigabere. So, today on today's antenatal session, we are going to please can you see the slide view of the presentation? Yes. Yes, you can. Okay, thank you. All right, so we are going to be talking about care of your baby after delivery. You know, most of the times that's where the difficulty is, especially for um, first time mothers. So, and these are the topics will be, sub topics will be taking under the care of the baby after delivery. You have to be talking about the importance of breastfeeding, breastfeeding positions, express breast milk, cord care, and then bathing of your baby after delivery. Just a minute. All right. So sorry. One thing. Uh, hello, welcome. For those of you just joining us, you're welcome. So, so. Actually, um, like I said, we are talking about care of the baby after delivery. And the most important thing after the care of, um, after delivery is breastfeeding. So we are going to talk on the importance of breastfeeding. And we know that breastfeeding is just the act of nursing your baby with breast milk. And this comes naturally. It's already prepared. It's time saving. And your baby has all the nutrients and requirement that he or she needs to grow. So one of we would like to know um, the importance of breastfeeding. One of the benefits of breastfeeding, breastfeeding actually has a lot of benefits. It has a benefit, it has a benefits both the mother and it benefits both the baby. So looking at the benefits to the baby, you can see that during the initial stage of breastfeeding, or you know, the first time you initiate breastfeeding, there's this first milk that comes out, which is called colostrum, and it's highly nutritious is thick and yellowish in color. And this colostrum is made up of antibodies and immunoglobulins, which are special types of proteins. 
that help to boost the baby's immunity. And another benefit of breast milk or breastfeeding to a baby is that it's prepacked with vitamins, proteins, fat, and other food nutrients. And at this stage, you don't have to worry about if my baby gets in the required um, quantity or the required amount of vitamins he or she needs to grow, required amount of protein, because this breast milk comes naturally and is already prepacked in such a way that it is easily digestible for the baby. It also aids in baby's growth and development. Yes, breast milk helps baby to grow, grow as adequately as they are supposed to. And it all, another benefit is that it's readily available and accessible. Available, availability, you don't have to go to the store to buy it. It's actually in, in your breast. So it's pre-packed. I like to call it um, a child's mobile can. That's what I call it because it's readily available and the baby can easily access it. And at any given point in time, you don't have to run around about, oh, I need to boil water. I need to wash this. I don't know. You don't need that. It's just available naturally. It's God's gift to us. It also it lowers the risk of babies developing allergies. Yes, like I said earlier, that this um, breast milk, aside colostrum, has immunoglobulin, which are proteins that help babies to fight against or ward off against infections. So it lowers a baby's risk of developing allergies at that early age. And it also promotes bonding for the baby and also for the mother. So looking at the benefits to the mother, most women are worried about losing weight after they've delivered, especially during pregnancy. They're like, ah, every time they go for natal, they check their weight and they're like, whoa, I've gained weight. You don't have to worry. Once you're breastfeeding, breastfeeding has a way of helping you burn calories. And at that point, during the postpartum period, you can easily shed off those weights that were gained during pregnancy. It also helps with the release of, an, uh, of a hormone called oxytocin. And this oxytocin, what it does is that it actually helps the mother, the mother's uterus, to return back to its normal, original shape and size when it was not pregnant, when you were not pregnant. So that's what this breastfeeding does. It sends, it's once the baby latches on, it sends a signal to your brain. Your brain releases this hormone. And this hormone acts on your uterus, helping the uterus contract more. And that's how most of you, when you're breastfeeding, you can have, you feel some, so you have some sort of feelings like cramps. That what actually is happening is your uterus contracting, trying to go back and return to its original shape and size as at which it was before you got pregnant. So also it reduces uterine bleeding. Yes. With this, as your uterus is contracting, as this hormone is acting, it also, the bleeding from the uterus, it helps reduce that bleeding after birth. So that's what um, breastfeeding does for the mother. It also reduces the risk of breast and ovarian cancer for the mother. Yes, that's what breastfeeding does. And above all, breastfeeding saves time, it saves money. Yes, because unlike, Unlike when you're using um, formula, it takes time. At least you have to take your time to boil water. You have even when you boil the water, you have to take your time to like mix the water. You have to take your time, wash your hands, and all those stuff that you do while you want to prepare a formula. But for breastfeeding, it's not so. All you just need to do is wash your hands. It saves time. There's no there's no so much ceremony about it during breastfeeding. Then also breastfeeding promotes bonding. Yes, like I, it, you can see it, it came up again for the mother, it promotes bonding both for the mother and for the baby. So these are the benefits of breastfeeding for, on the mother and then on the baby as well. There are several positions for breastfeeding and the success of breastfeeding lies on your comfort. Ordinarily, breastfeeding should not in any way be painful and it should not in any way be difficult. But what makes it difficult is when you lack these three basic principles, which I call the ABC principle, 
of breastfeeding, awareness, being patient, and your comfort. So feeding correctly takes patience and practice. Usually at the first instance when you initiate breastfeeding, it's, it can be so, especially if the baby's not latching properly. But if your baby's latching properly and you may, you're able to maintain this ABC principle, breastfeeding is easy and simple. So getting into a comfortable position is very essential for the success of breastfeeding, which should be pain free and easy. The best position for you during breastfeeding, many people will ask, okay, what's the best position? There are several positions during breastfeeding, but the best position is the one in which you yourself as a mother and your baby are comfortable. So whichever position you are doing and it's comfortable to you and it's comfortable to your baby, then you're good to go. The breastfeeding process should be easy and shouldn't take much time and shouldn't be difficult for you. As you can see, I hope you can see the diagram, the illustration, please. Yes. Okay. So as you can see, we have um, different, like I said, we have different methods of breastfeeding, we have different positions. But the most common one that we do is cradle hold, which is the first illustration. Is the cradle hold. We have the football hold. You have the cross cradle hold, and you have the side lying um, hold. Aside this, for there are other positions as well. But this cradle hold is the most common type of breastfeeding position, and that's what I'll be dwelling most on. For the cradle position of a breastfeeding, basically it's not difficult, but you have to assume a comfortable position either on a couch or on a chair. And for maximum support and uh, comfortability, you can use pillows to support yourself, either at your back or be below your abdomen. And for maximum support and comfort again, you can use a foot hole, a, a foot stool, because sometimes you know you can be sitting on a chair and your leg is not quite balanced on the ground. So you may need to use a foot stool to be able to assume a comfortable position. And ordinarily, when you're sitting, you have to be in, in a comfortable position with a backrest. Your chair should have always have a backrest. Do not use a chair that doesn't have a backrest because at some point you're going to get tired and the pain will be at your lower back, which is not supposed to be during breastfeeding. And one thing you have to know that during breastfeeding, it's not you bringing the breast to the baby. You bring the baby to the breast. So, cradle position of breastfeeding. The first thing to do is you rest your baby's head on the tip of your elbow, just like you saw at the uh, um, on the previous slide. On the tip of your elbow, with the, with their whole body, your baby's body should be facing you while you're supporting their head. On at your with your with the prop of your elbow, so you position your baby's belly against your own belly, with and this will help with much more support. And if you can't do that alone, you can use um, a pillow to support your hand below your abdomen. So with your other hand, you cup your breast, scissoring in between the nipples, and then with your tongue, you just gradually stroke the breast on the baby's mouth until he or she latches on and begins to suckle. But if you feel your baby does not suckle, this is what I'm talking about, attachment. If you feel your baby is, has not latched properly, there is no harm in starting the process all over again. Just gently remove the breast out of, or the nipple out of the baby's mouth and then start the whole process again with the positioning and then to the attachment. So basically you can see this illustration of an attachment. You can see the arrow, you can see the nipples, you can see the areola. Ordinarily, the baby's mouth should be able to, the areola is that dark spot around the nipple. So ordinarily, when your baby latches properly, he or she, the mouth will be, will cover the areola, the whole, entire areola. And that way, when the baby is sucking you, it will feel sore to you as a mother. 
and the baby will, be, will easily breastfeed without any difficulty and without any hitches. So looking at this illustration, you can see how you stroke, bring the nipples and the areola close to the baby's mouth, stroking it so that the baby can open. Because once they sense, once they're able to sense, they know, oh, this is food. So automatically their brain tells them, okay, I'm about to feed. So it sends the sucking reflex are thereby stimulated. That way they will open their mouth and be able to latch. You can see how this attachment goes with this illustration, with the diagram. So still on the breastfeeding positions, you can see, you can see that there are some breastfeeding positions that are not good. Breastfeeding should always be easy and shouldn't be painful and stressful to you as a mother and also to the baby. So you can see from this illustration on this slide that you can see the different positions that are bad and then the ones that are good. If you're not comfortable, if your legs are not firm on the ground, you can, there's no harm in using a, a foot tool, like I said. You can also go as far as using a pillow to support your elbow and your abdomen. That way you're able to feel comfortable. And like I said, you don't bring, you don't bend when breastfeeding. You don't bring breast to baby. Rather, you bring the baby to you, to the breast. So that way you're able to maintain a good and comfortable position. So having talked about um, breastfeeding, it's important. Sorry, for those of you that are ju just joining us, we are talking about care of the baby after delivery. And we've gone over um, breastfeeding, the importance. Like we said, the importance includes for the baby, it provides um, adequate nutrients, food nutrients, fats, proteins, and vitamins that this baby needs to grow well. It also improves, helps, and uh, promotes baby's growth and development. It contains antibodies anti um, and proteins, immunoglobulins, that help your baby fight, fight and ward up against infections and diseases, and also reduces their risk of developing allergies. And then to the mother, we also say that Breastfeeding helps the uterus to go back to its previous and original shape and size before it became pregnant. And also, you know, when mothers um, during pregnancy, they're always worried about the weight gain. So while you're breastfeeding, it has a way of burning calories, which help you reduce and burn off those extra, uh, um, extra weight gains during pregnancy. It also reduces the risk of um, breast cancer, and the cervical cancer. So we just talked about breastfeeding positions. I said there are different positions to assume during breastfeeding, but the most common one is the cradle position, which we are most conversant of have. Even if it's our first time, at least we've seen people breastfeed, and those are the, that is the most common um, position of breastfeeding. And breastfeeding, like I said, should not be difficult. It should be easy, as long as you maintain the ABC principle. And this ABC principle has to be, do with awareness. In terms of awareness, we are talking of you knowing when your baby is hungry. It's not until a baby cries that you say he or she is hungry. There are some signs that babies do when you drop them that you know, ah, my baby is hungry. Some of them can begin to smack their lips. Some of them can even begin to like try to put their hands in their mouth to suckle on something. At that point, you should know that your baby is hungry and that is awareness. And then B has to be, you have to be patient with this baby. They are not adults that can easily rush food. They are babies and they're going to suckle. At some point, they will get tired. It's normal. They will get tired rest. And when, they, when you just like leave them for a while, they remember, oh, okay, I'm, I need to suckle again. I have something in my mouth. They'll begin to suckle back again. So at that point, you have to be patient with your baby. You don't have to rush the baby. And then the, C principle has to be your comfort, like I said, and that is the most important, your comfort. Because if you're not comfortable, your baby is not comfortable during um, breastfeeding or the position due, due to the uh, position you assume. You are, it's going to be difficult, it's going to be so. And like I said, breastfeeding should not in any way be difficult and it should not in any way be painful. So assuming it a comfortable position, you can for more than comfort aside sitting in your chair you can use extra pillows to support your back you can use extra pillows to support your abdomen you can use a foot stool to
to support your legs so that that way you're comfortable your baby is comfortable and the breastfeeding process should go easily so now we are going to express breast milk usually there is no difference between the breast milk when baby suckles directly and when you express your milk this milk comes naturally it's not like the pre prepared formula or prepackaged formula express breast milk is a natural is just a form of bringing out the breast milk with the aid of maybe your hand or um breast pump just for you just so that you can um store it or you can ensure that your baby is feeding well express expressing breast milk there are a number of reasons why people and um, express breast milk it may be maybe for some mothers you may be breastfeeding at some point you know so they can't actually give you six months um, maternity leave and you really want your baby to do the exclusive breast milk and uh, you have no choice but to express your breast milk. Another reason one may want to express breast milk is if your breast are engorged and it's making you feel uncomfortable, you can express the breast milk and and keep it for um, later use. It doesn't, it won't spoil because it comes naturally and there is nothing wrong with expressing your breast milk. And then another reason one may want to express is when you're not even sure of the quantity of, of feed your baby is taking. Yes, most times you feel, oh, my baby is suckling. He has, he has suckled on this breast, on both breasts for about an hour plus. And you find that at the end of the day that this baby has not even taken up to about 60 meals of that breast milk he or she has been suckling for over an hour. Yes, it, it's like that. And most times the amount or, or quantity of breast milk or you're going to express is not dependent on the type of breast, it's not dependent on the on how big your breast is. That's one thing um, misconceptions we keep on. Oh, my breast is big, my baby is going to have enough. That's not true. So expressing breast milk. So expressing breast milk has a number of reasons and why you want to express you may you may you may have other reasons why you want to express but it's not it's not bad for you to express your breast milk and keep for later use so coming to express breast milk just simply means squeezing out your breast squeezing milk out of your breast so that you can store it and feed your baby later it can be not done for a number of reasons, which I already said, like maybe you you have to be away from your baby, maybe because of work or other things, or if you want to be able to quantify what your baby is um, taking, or if your breast is engorged and is painful. Yes, because when your breasts are engorged and you've not expressed those breasts, or your baby has not sucked them, it can be, it can be really painful for the mother. So these are the number of reasons why you express. And how do you express? You can either express by hand. Some people prefer using their hand. Some people may decide to use a breast pump. And you know, there are two types of breast pump. We have the manual breast pump and the electrical breast pump. So these are just um, some samples of um, breast pump. You could see the manual, you could see the electrical. The electrical, sometimes you may have to need constant power supply. And there are some that you can just charge and use even if there is no um, electrical supply. But the manual one, you just have to like, it doesn't use electricity. So you just use your hand to inflate the bulb and deflate. So you do it separately and that keep doing it, it's letting down the breast milk. So there are important tips I need you to know before you express. So before you start expressing the breast milk, you should always wash your hands. We should always try and wash our hands with soap and water. Even if you've just washed your hand and you did something, please, before you feed your baby, it's very important that we wash our hands because most times we use our hands for a lot of things to touch a lot of places. And at the end of the day, our hands are contaminated. And in as much as the breast milk, the nipples and the areola are usually clean naturally because there is um, the, naturally the body secretes oil and lubricates the nipples and the areola which helps to keep it clean. But 
irrespective of that, we also have to wash our hands because most times we're going to use the same hand to grab the breast. And when you grab the breast, you've contaminated it and your baby's going to suckle on it. That way your baby might get infection easily. So it's important that if you must breastfeed, if you must express, not just expressing breast milk, even if you must breastfeed, please always wash your hands with soap and water. And always have your bottles ready. It can be the feeding bottle. You, you also, yeah, it could be the um, storage bags. Yes, there are breast milk storage bags that are, are available in the supermarket where you can store breast milk. But if you can't get the storage bag, you can use the baby's bottle, but always make sure that they are clean and always ready to be used. And, and most importantly, um, gently massaging the breast um, helps a lot um, in terms of expressing breast milk. It will also it will help when you, in the letdown of uh, breast milk. So gently massaging the breast, if it's pressing, helps a lot. And this massage, you could use a towel with warm water to massage your breast before expressing. So with this illustration um, on this slide, you can see that this lady is trying to express manually with her hands. So that's the way you grab the breast. Your hand should not touch the nipple or the areola area while you're trying to express breast milk. Because if you begin to rub, rub over, over the nipples, over the areola, you're likely to contaminate the milk. Because most times, if you even without having to breast it, because of the oil around that area, when you begin to rub around the area, you find out that, that some debris will begin to fall out there, like they'll become black and stuff like that, and it can get into the breast milk. And this is breast milk that you're going to feed your baby. So try as much as possible if you want. Um, express with your hand not to touch your nipple or the areola area. So you could also see the another illustration showing how to express using the manual breast pump and also the electrical breast pump. So this is actually a double um, breast pump. Yes, most breast pump comes with a uh, can be double. You can express both breasts at the same time. So manually you have to use your hand to inflate and deflate the, the airbag. But for the electrical, basically you're not doing any work. The machine does the work. So basically using the electrical is very faster and easy, even though it's uh, much expensive than the manual breast pump, which is um, uh, less costly, but takes a lot of time and, and consumes energy as well. So, Using the electrical saves you a lot of time, saves you a lot of stress, and it's easy to use. All you just need to do is ensure that the caps are fitted around your areola and your nipples. And then you just put it on. It begins to gently massage your breast and begins to um, 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 squeeze the breast milk out of the breast. So it's actually easy to use and quite um, affordable. So most importantly, um, storing breast milk Yes, when you express breast milk, how do you store it? It's very important to know how to store your breast milk. Ordinary um, breast milk can be stored in, in a sterilized container with special breast milk storage bags, like I mentioned earlier. And if you're going to use it almost immediately, you can feed directly. There's no, there's no need to pre-warm breast, express breast milk if you're going to use it immediately after you're done expressing. But if you're not going to use it immediately, please, you have to put it in a fridge, not a freezer. Yes, it can actually be frozen, but it's not advisable. So it's best to put it in the fridge. It, and it can, it, it can be in the fridge for up to eight days at a certain temperature. But I'm sure most of us, um, we use, this is a fridge. It's not like we have a special fridge for storing our breast milk. We are going to use our normal fridge, which we use at home. And we know that this temperature is not at four degrees Celsius, and it's not, it's not below it. So because we are not sure of the temperature, please do not leave the breast milk for more than three days. It should be used within three days, in as much as it can last up to eight days in the fridge at a certain temperature. But because we are not certain of the temperature, considering the fact that we don't have a special fridge to store this breast milk at home, because we are going to use our commercial or general fridge at home, please use the best that you consume the breast milk within three days after expressing. 
And it's best to stop the breast milk in smaller quantities to avoid waste. Yes, do not go and buy um, big storage bottles, breast milk storage bottles. Buy smaller ones so that in that way, you're, you, if you know, if you're bringing, if it's like maybe 90 meals, you bring out 90 meals, you know your baby's going to finish the 90 meals all at once and you discard that container or you wash it. Don't go and maybe buy a container that can take up to 200 meals and you stop to 200 meals of breast milk in it and your baby takes up to maybe 60 out of the 200 and you still want to put back the, that particular container in the fridge. No, it's wrong. Because you know, while your baby is suckling on those bottles, enzymes, there are enzymes in the mouth and these enzymes will definitely get to work. So as your baby is suckling, those enzymes, some of them will be deposited on that bottle and you still want to go and store it back. That will breed infection. It, it's a source of, it, it can be a source of infection to your baby. Because next time when you want to use it, I'm sure you're not going to clean the, the bottle teeth. You will just use it directly. So it's best to store your um, express breast milk in smaller quantities so that you'll be able to use them and it won't be a waste. So always express um, label and date. Yes, very important. You label and date every express breast milk before storing it. Don't just express and store, express and store. That way you'll be able to use the one that has been dated the that is about to be dated that the, the post dated ones faster so that if if you express today you level that up today if you have express tomorrow you level that up the one you express tomorrow that way if you're going to use it tomorrow oh you, the first thing to do is to use the one that has the post date don't use the current date use the post date that way you're able to use up what um, the breast milk that you have expressed and most importantly do not microwave express breast milk in no condition, don't even say, oh, microwaving is going to be faster. No, do not in any way microwave breast milk. If you must use breast milk, just pre-warm it, boil water, put in a, in a, in a bowl or, or cup, then carry the bottle and dip inside and leave it there for a while. It's going to warm, pre-warm it, and then feed your baby. So we are going to cut care. Yes, you know, that's talking of the umbilical cord, very important because most times um, that we have challenges there. Cord care, you know, during the intrauterine life, this cord is what attaches the baby to the mom. There, the baby gets nutrients, exchange, waste, and all that are done with this. But when the baby is born, this cord is cut and clamped. And it's very important that we keep this cord clean at all times because it can be a, um, a source of infection to your baby if not properly cared for and that's why we'll be talking about cord care so in cord care there are do's and don'ts of cord care usually this cord should be able to should at first when the baby is born it's shiny it's clear you can see it is yellow and shiny and all that very beautiful but after some days, you find out that it begins to shiver, it begins to um, shrink before it falls off. Usually this um, happens within 10 to 14 days after birth. But if it doesn't fall within 10 to 14 days, it's fine. Do not panic. It can last as much as 21 days before it falls off. Um, and according to the um, World Health Organization guidelines for the care of babies called you use um, to help with them. Application of prohexid in there should be done once daily from the base of the stump to the top. I'm sure if you have a um, antenatal um, um, list, delivery list, this prohexid in there is one of the requirements. And usually it's applied once daily. So if you, bait, if you bait your baby in the morning, you just apply it, that's it for the day. And subsequently, if you feel that there is a, a need to clean this cord, you use methylated spirits. How often you're going to clean the cord depends. You can clean as much as possible as you can. And you can also clean with every diaper change. So if you're not able to do it, okay, every uh, um, hour or every two hour, you can not clean at each point you're changing the baby's diaper. But at each point you're changing the baby's diaper, you're no longer using the Clohex in gel. You're actually using methylated spirit and a cotton swab and you clean from the base to the top. 
you clean gradually. Do not rub it. Do not rub it. Just gradual clean, gently cleaning, cleaning the cord. And the don'ts of don't of cord care. Avoid most times when we give birth, you know, it's all the days they use animal dons to make it, they'll tell you, oh, apply this, apply this concussion, apply this, apply this um, oil, apply this animal dung, it's to make it fall faster. Please don't. Rather you're, it's a, it's rather you're doing the baby more harm than good if you're doing such. So please avoid application of any animal dung on baby's cord or any form of cream or concussion. Anything that is not stated now, if it's not chlorhexidine gel, if it's not spirit, please do not apply any other thing on your baby's cord. Avoid touching or pulling on baby's cord. Yes, yeah, sometimes most people are fond of that. They will want to like, uh, they'll be pulling the cord to see, maybe to help it or aid it fall off faster. Please don't do that because you can easily pull and the baby will begin to bleed. Do not pull on your baby's cord and avoid touching it because Constant touching, like I said, our hands always carry a lot of gems. Constant touching, you're introducing gems to the cord. So please do not touch the cord if you're not cleaning it. Always fold your baby's diaper to rest below the cord. Yeah, the baby's diaper should not, do not put the cord inside baby's diaper. If you must change baby's diaper, the cord should be above the diaper. It should, be, which means the diaper will come below. So you have to fold the diaper below the cord. Reason being that if this, if you fold the cord into the diaper, this baby urinates. And most times you don't know when your baby urinates. It's only okay when you want, you feel like, okay, let me change, check if he or she is wet. You now find, oh, he has weak, he has food. So within that period, you are not aware that your baby has urinated or even passed. Those urine begin to decompose as well as the feces, and it can contaminate the cord and the diaper to rest below the cord. And please, most importantly, be gentle with the baby's cord. So, signs to check for cord infection. Yes, in as much as we are caring for this cord, we are cleaning it on a regular basis and doing the normal thing we should do. We should always check for signs of infection. And some signs that you may see is redness. Yes, the, around the cord area, the abdomen, the navel, you can see some redness, you can see some swelling around that place. Please always report to the doc, to your doctor, to your pediatrician, or to your um, healthcare provider, if you notice any of these signs. Maybe when they are discharging, yes, if, you, if the cord is not properly cared for, you will find out that you will see, it. even if it will be glaring to you, you will see some white discharges, you will see some yellowish discharges. You could even see blood at the end of the cord. So all these are signs that infection is ongoing. So please visit your healthcare provider or report to your pediatrician. Another sign could be uh, sign of, another sign of pain around or sign of infection is when there is pain or tenderness around the navel. And how do you know this? You know, your baby cannot talk. You only know this. When you, whenever you touch the place and they begin to cry, there's this kind of cry, not just when you, ordinarily, when you want to clean the cord, some of them, it can be discomforting for them, especially when you use spirits. It's not like it's painful. It's just the fact that it is cold. That is different. When you touch the cord or areas around the navel or the abdomen and your baby is crying, please, it's a sign that something is ongoing. So we are coming to another subtopic, which is baiting of your baby. Mostly, um, one health organization recommend that uh, baby should, we should wait at least 24 to 48 hours, uh, 24 to 28 hours before the baby's first birth. But you know, sometimes some mothers, even after delivery, you see them, ah, when is my baby going to bed? Please be patient and relax. Your baby, it's very important that your baby waits at least 24 28 hours before having his or her first birth. But mostly in the hospitals, we may not observe up to 24 hours, we may just do a few hours, depending on the time your baby was born. Because mostly we bathe babies early hours of the morning. So if your baby was born over the night, means, okay, you have almost like 16 hours before your baby takes a bath, it's not bad. But bathing a baby immediately is not advisable. So you have to wait for a certain number of hours before baiting your baby. 
And most importantly, newborn babies need a sponge bath when their umbilical cords have not fallen, as well as when their circumcision has not healed. So you don't just um, bait, okay, I want to bait my baby, you bring up a bathtub and just submerge your baby into it. No, your baby, what your baby needs is a sponge bath. And we are going to go through this process now. So according to American, how long do you think you can bait your baby? How often do you bait, bait, bait your baby? According to American uh, Academy of Pediatrics, they suggest we bait our baby three times daily, which means alternate days in a week three times in a week, sorry, alternate days. As long as you clean the face, the neck, and the diaper area on a daily basis. I've seen someone, baby can, that does not mean your baby cannot. The benefits of uh, bathing sponge bath to your baby. It promotes bonding for you as a mother and as um, and for your baby as well. It improves um, breastfeeding success, keeps your baby's skin um, skin from drying out. So that is, it's really good that we bait our baby, give our baby sponge baits, especially newborns. When the cord has not fallen off and when their circumcision has not healed, always give them a sponge bath. So what do you need? Your premise for a sponge bath, of course, your baby towel, your baby but body wash, two wash cloths. You have um, a bowl of warm water. And this warm water, it has to be at a desired temperature. You can use either a bath thermometer or use the back of your elbow here. Just dip it into the warm water to be sure that the temperature is um, okay before you can use it on your baby so you don't burn the baby. Then you have several cotton swabs, you have lotion, your diaper wipes, a suitable change, that is the clothes your baby would uh, be changing into, your chlorhexidine gel and your comb as well. So how do you bait your baby? How is this done? Always ensure that your items are arranged before you even expose your baby. Arrange your items and it should be within your reach. The item should be within your reach. Yes, very important. Hand wash is very important. Our, when we don't, a lot has to do with hand wash. So wash your hands thoroughly. Then the first thing to do is baby's eyes. Using a washcloth, you clean. Using a washcloth, you clean like this. You use one end of the washcloth to clean from inside out. That's the way you do it. Same thing, you use another end, you clean inside out. Don't use the same end you use for this eye on this other eye. Use two different ends of this washcloth and the clean water, not soap, without soap. And clean inside out, inside out, down to the ear with clear water. So you use, always use a fresh pad for each eye. Then for the face. So using the washcloth, you don't use soap. Using the washcloth, just dip it in water. When it wet, just clean, clean, clean the, your baby's soap. Do not use soap. Just the washcloth and the towel. Clean your baby's face. After you must have done the eye, the nostrils, and every other area, as well as the ear. You clean the ear as well. Do not use a cotton swab inside your baby's ear. Very important. Most people will say, oh, water, I think water entered the baby's ear. I want, to, I want to clean it up. I want to dry it up. Do not use a cotton swab inside the baby's ear. For the hair and scalp, you can see how to position your baby if you must wash the hair and the scalp. Do not submerge your baby's head inside water, please. So you pick up your baby, you support the head like with the, with the um, illustration on, the, on this slide, and with the back resting on your, and on your elbow. Holding your baby this way will give the baby a sense of security, even you. 
So you wet the baby's head with clear water, just clear water. They're using a small amount of soap. You just, you know, just drop little drops of soap on the baby's head. Then you can just use um, your hand to gently massage the soap so it lathers. And when it lathers, you can just use the washcloth, you know, just rub gently in a circular motion. And then, but still holding your baby's head over the basin, you just rinse. You just rinse off the soap and then clean the head. So for the body, please, um, in as much as I'm taking it slowly, you know, this process, you have to be fast about it because your baby is exposed. Your baby is not an adult, so they can easily get cold. So you have to keep the baby warm at all times. So as you're giving your baby this bath, you have to um, be time conscious not to expose the baby for so long because you're giving he or she a bath. So for the body, you place your baby on the pad. You make um, you you can just use your hand to take soap, lather the baby's body body gently, and ensure that every skin folds around the baby using your hand. You just lather the soap around the area, the neck, you um, fingers. You know you start from the neck, working your way down to the um, trunk, to the baby's hand, to the baby's um, armpit, working your way down to the diaper area, genital area, you know, before you use the washcloth, then wash. When you're done washing, you just rinse the baby, wash, rinse off the soap with a washcloth. So that washcloth, you dip it in a clean water and use it to rinse off the soap. Don't just go and be pouring water on your baby. No, use the washcloth rather to dip in a clean water and, and rinse off the soap. Then dry your baby with a soft towel. Apply lotion. You do the cord care, which we already talked about. So, so if the cord care, please, if once your baby has had his or her bath, the cord care, when you're doing the first cord care, which is daily after birth, using the Clohex ginger, please do not use spirits to clean the cord. Just apply the Clohex ginger. Then subsequently, when you want to change the diaper or you feel you want to do the cord care, just use spirit and cotton wool and not clohex ginger. If you must use clohex ginger, do not use spirit to clean the cord. So you dress up your baby, feed your baby, and put your baby to sleep. So safety tips while um, bathing your baby. Please always ensure that your requirements are ready before each bath. Not when you've exposed your baby. Remember, ah, soap is not here, you run out. No, please. Always ensure that all the requirements are ready before each bath. The temperature of the water, very important, should be warm and always keep baby warm. Always keep a firm hold on your baby so that you know because their body is slippery and of course they'll be moving, they'll be making some movement. Please always keep a firm hold so that they don't slip and fall because of the soap. If you must turn away to maybe pick something by the side, always keep one hand on your baby. One hand should be on your baby constantly. Even if you must come to your side to pick something or you must um, look back or look away to pick something, please always keep one hand on your baby. And also, very, very important, the most important, never leave your baby alone during a bath unattended to. Not even for a second. Even if what you want to pick is in that same room, not even for a second, please do not leave your baby alone during a bath. Not, because even an inch of water can drown your baby. An inch of water here yes, can drown your baby. In that split of second, you just move away. So always do not leave your baby unattended to when doing a bath. So with this, we have come to the end of this um, antenatal session. Thank you for listening. So um, at this point, I'd like to take questions if you have any. Thank you, Christabel. Oh, good morning, ma. Hello, please. Um, please, I'd like to take your questions. If you have any questions or you need clarification, please. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. My name is Mrs. Jumoke. Please, I would like to ask in the aspect of because I I saw when you wrote that one should not lift up the foreskin 
of a baby that is not yet circumcised, especially a male child. What about when you circumcise? How do you now, because I think it will still be fresh. After circumcision, how do you bait your... Oh, you don't really have much problem if your baby has been circumcised, giving him a birth. You just bait the norm baby normally like you usually do. Then when you get to the genital area, of course it's going to be sensitive and it's going to be fresh. You just use the wash the washcloth to clean around the area. That's all. Do not go pulling on the on the on the circumcision side. Just clean normally. Just wash normally like you do. Even when okay. he or she he even when he was not he has not been circumcised. Sorry. So just clean normally. You don't have a problem with the circumcision and beating your baby. Um, oh, okay. thank you. All right. So, please, does any other person have a question? Who else has? A right, good morning. Yeah, good morning. I can hear you. Okay, Welcome. so please. Um, thank you. So for how long um, are you supposed to use the chloretic gel before the spirit? The chlorhexidine gel. Okay, like I said, chlorhexidine gel is just applied daily, once daily. So once you just do it at that point when he or she um, had a bath, the amount of time in which you should leave it there does not, um, uh, there is no specified time because of course it's going to dry up within minutes. So. Before any diaper change, maybe you may not want to clean immediately you have applied, you may just leave it to when you want to change the diaper before you now start using spirit. Then for the rest of the day, once you, for the rest of the day, you can just decide, okay, I want to be cleaning this cord and um, every two hours, you just use spirit. But for the chlorhexidine gel, it will dry up in, a, in, in just a matter of um, minutes to add. Is that clear? Yes, thank you so much. All right. Hello. Hello. Yes, I can hear you. Good morning. Um, Good morning, yo. How long can you keep um a breast milk after expressing? Okay, like I said, actually, breast milk can stand for eight up to eight days at a certain temperature in the fridge. But because this fridge, like I said, is free, we don't have like a special fridge in our homes that we. This, uh, designed or delegated to be storing this express breast milk under a particular temperature, which should be at a four degrees Celsius or below that four degrees Celsius. So because it's a general, uh, like a general fridge for the house use, for household use, it's best to use it within three days. Okay. And if you must use it within three days, that's why I said, if you must express, you express in smaller quantities and if you, if you express in smaller quantities, it's best you label it and date, attach a date to each express breast milk so that you know which one to use first. You don't use the most recent one to breastfeed, to, to feed your baby after you've expressed. No, you use the one that has been date, outdated first. Do you understand? Hello? 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 Yes, can you hear what I said? Yes, I heard you. Thank yes, you. So always express in smaller quantities and always label and date them so that you know which one to use first. Okay. So basically leave it for three days, maximum three days, in as much as it can stay up to eight days, but because we're not setting up the temperature of the fridge, three days. All right. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, I All have right, a question. I want to ask about um okay. using a nipple using a nipple cream. Is it safe to use a nipple cream and breastfeed? Please do not use any nipple cream. The only thing you can do is maybe after breastfeeding, you can just apply vesely around your nipple. But please do not use a nipple cream because most of these things have chemicals in them and you don't know what is, you don't know what has been used in them. 
So please do not use a nipple cream when breastfeeding. Like I said, it's your breast. Once you've had your bath, you maintain, once you maintain a good personal hygiene, especially around your breast as well, so you don't need any full cream before you breastfeed. The only thing you can do is maybe apply the um, um, Vaseline, just like blue seal, Vaseline blue seal around the nipples later uh, afterwards, after breastfeeding. So please do not apply any nipple, nipple cream because your baby is going to suckle on that breast and has the tendency to suckle on those on those cream and then take it into the system and it becomes it becomes a problem because they are made of chemicals. Okay, thank you. Right. So, any other question, please? There are some questions on the chat room. On the chat room. <laughs> Sorry, let me check. Okay. Okay. Hello, please. As regards the breast pump, which one will you recommend? Manual or electric or any one of those? Actually, like I said, both are actually good. But you know, the problem with manual is that it's time consuming and it's not as fast as the electric. Even though at the initial stage, at the first time of breastfeeding, initiating breastfeeding, the breast may not really flow like that. And like I said, the size of your breast does not determine the amount of breast milk you produce. That misconception it has to go. So at the initial stage, it may take a while for this breast milk to come because most of the um, milk ducts are not really um, producing enough at that initial stage. But with time and with, um, with um, adequate nutrition and the mother's part and adequate fluid intake, it's going to flow gradually. And most times, like I said, the comfort of um, expressing or, or breastfeeding has to do with um, the mom. Especially even your mental state has a lot, has a lot to go. If you're not relaxed, breast milk will also not flow. Aside not taking water or adequate nutrition to um, help your breast flow. So using the manual will take time at that initial stage. But subsequently, you will get a hang of it, but it's still, it will still consume your time. So using a manual in over an hour, if you're, if, or like the electric, over an hour, the electric can like express up to about 60. But using the manual, that's what the electrical does in, one, in an hour. The manual will do it like in three hours. So I advise you go for the electrical because it will save you a lot of time and a lot of hassles as well. So I will recommend you use the, uh, more of the electrical. But in case, but the only problem, the advantage that the manual has over the electrical is the fact when there is no light, because you have to have constant um, electric sub, uh, supply to this breast pump for you to be able to use the electrical. But what if in a situation you don't have light, manual will go. So it depends, it may be on your choice, but me, I'll still recommend the electrical. So even if there is no light, you can just use your hands to express, which is not also a bad idea. Please, how do you get milk running if you have a C-section? Actually, yes. Um, for those people that have um, C-section, you know, ordinarily, um, breastfeeding should be initiated in daily after birth. But for someone who has a C-section, due to pains and then um, the fact the effect of anesthesia, you may not be able to breastfeed immediately. You may have to like have some time before you, you're able to breastfeed. But within this period, you actually on fluid, IV fluids before you even start taking orally. So within the first 24 hours, at least you should be able to initiate breastfeeding. If it's for first time mothers, it may take time. It may take, the first day breastfeeding may not really come but on the second day it will come. But for people that have done this over and over again, even after a C-session, their breast milk can, all, can flow almost immediately once they initiate breastfeeding after that 24 hours. So there's no um, hard and fast way to get breast milk flowing after a C-session. The only difference is just the fact that you have to, um, your baby will not initiate breastfeeding on that day you had the C-section, maybe the following day. But that doesn't mean that your breast milk will, will not Flu. The breast milk will actually flow once you cook the baby and the baby latches on the breast because 
Once the baby latches, it sends signal to the brain. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> it sends signal to the brain and it presses <coughs> production part. Sorry. <coughs> Please, can I have the previous lectures? Even this, because I joined late. Like the link to listening to them. Okay. Actually, we'll send the link to. I'll I'll let them know. They'll send the link to you for you to listen to the previous lectures and also this one. It's on actually on YouTube on our YouTube channel, so you will definitely see it there. We'll send the link to you for you to listen to them over again. So please, does anyone other person have a question? Any other question, please? Any other question? Uh -huh. Okay, please, can you go ahead, Ms. Abimbola? I can. Miss, okay, I just had to unmute you now. How can a mother that has a flat or inverted navel <clears throat> be helped to breastfeed? Yes. Very importantly, um, I think there was a cough on this uh, type of nipple. Ordinarily, during pregnancy, when you're pregnant, even before you deliver, the nipple has to be prepared, especially for those that have inverted nipple or flat nipple. The nipple has to be prepared even before your delivery. Where's your nipple? Your husband can actually help suckle on your nipple during your pregnancy um, time before you deliver to help get this nipple and to help get this nipple prepared for after delivery. There are other ways you can also um, um, help with, uh, persons with inverted nipple, even after the husband has suckled maybe throughout the period of pregnancy. You can, you can actually use it. It's, it's not really painful. I wouldn't really say it's painful. There's a way we could just like use the syringe to like, um, bring out the nipple drag the nipple out or even the use of a breast pump yes can help with inverted nipples it can actually help because what breast pump does is like it uses um there's this pressure kind of pressure you're using and it pulls on the nipple for those of you that have used the breast pump you can notice this when your um the breast pump is, is pumping the milk out of the breast you can see the nipple going inward and upward that way it, that way with the use of a breast pump your your nipple can actually be improved and your baby is good to breastfeed so usually breast um, and people with this kind of nipple it's always usually best to prepare before the baby your husband can help out with that and constantly using but you can just constantly like massage on your nipple and like could not like you're dragging it out just you know gently massage the nipple pulling it out with the vaccine that way it's not painful and this should be done before you deliver okay okay what's your take on mixed feeding as i have got an inverted nipple see having an inverted nipple does not prevent you from breastfeeding in fact we actually uh, um, and we encourage you to breastfeed your baby for at least six months before you introduce any other type of feed. So having an inverted nipple does not prevent you from doing exclusive breastfeeding. I wouldn't really encourage mixed feeding at within the first few six months of life. Reason being that um, exclusive breastfeeding has its benefits to both you as a mother and the baby as well and these benefits cannot be cannot be overemphasized and can never be overemphasized so it's best to do exclusive breastfeeding irrespective of having an inverted nipple so any other question please keep the questions coming Yes, any other question? Can you hear me? 
Okay, in the absence of any other question, I think we'll call it a wrap on this antenatal session for today. And thank you for listening and thank you for um, staying online with us. Do have a lovely weekend. Thank you, too. All right, see you during the next antenatal session. Thank you. You're welcome. So the message, the, the link to this will be available on our YouTube. And also we'll send the link to everybody just in case you want to go by it. So you have, um, you have it at your fingertips before you um, deliver. Thank you very much and you have a lovely weekend. You too. Thank you for the beautiful presentation. Yeah.